Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar on leadership lessons from lockdown. Delighted to see so many familiar faces and some new faces on the webinar today. So I'm about to hand over to Mock uh, from the Innovation Beehive who you can see next to me here. But before I do, I just want to talk a little bit about the Innovation Beehive to let you know what we do and who we are. So we are the Innovation Beehive. We accelerate the potential of teams and organizations. We work with a huge range of clients from government to SMEs to multinational corporations. So really diverse portfolio there. And the reason we can do that is because ultimately what makes organizations tick is people. And we are the people innovation experts. So without further ado, I'm going to hand straight over to Mark because he's the reason you're here today. So Mark, over Thanks to you. Much. Great. Hello, everyone. Very nice to see you on here. Um, so we've lived through some of the most personally and professionally disrupted times in history. And you'll see that lovely quote we had just at the beginning of the webinar there, which I took from last Sunday's Irish Times, uh, remembering my Irish heritage there. Re-entry will be challenging, but it's probably about time. And that's probably what people are thinking, actually, at the moment. We've been through a period of pause. For many of us, we've been furloughed. Many of us, actually, who haven't been furloughed, have been working 10 to the dozen to keep the wheels on. But what people are calling the great pause, as we begin to move out of lockdown um, and begin to live a semblance of normal life again, we, we think it's important that we just have one final pause and reflect upon what lessons we've learned from lockdown. So before we go into that, I want to start by thanking those clients and colleagues who contributed to the content of this webinar, either by interview, uh, you'll see some of those interviews later on, or by conducting, um, a, a filling in our survey that we sent out. So as the People Innovation Company, everything that we do is based solidly on insight. So we appreciate the insights that you shared with us and you should recognize a number of those insights and nuggets as I go through the lessons from lockdown. So for the 18 months before lockdown, we'd been interviewing leaders from across the world to understand the leadership lessons and uh, what they have learned through coping through massively disruptive times and times of change. They were talking about AI, the impact of business changing, um, machine learning, but actually, they were all talking about change and disruption, and it couldn't have been more timely. We launched it at Google on the 3rd of March, and by the 17th of March, we were running our webinars and all working from home. The change and the disruption was absolutely significant. But from the conversations that we had with leaders about living in disruptive times, we were able to chart a course through the pandemic, which we called the pathway or the roadmap through uncertainty. And it identified four key stages that we would all experience throughout the pandemic. Moving from trying to make sense of what was happening in the stabilized phase, keeping business and our personal selves together in the sustained phase, planning and beginning to return to work in the return phase, and then looking towards the future in Renew. And at each stage, leaders had to demonstrate different behaviours and overcome different challenges. Our pathway through uncertainty speaks to the very human need to make sense of what is happening. At first, it appears a logical progression from certainty to renewal, but life and work are never as sanitised as that. This change curve predicts the emotional transitions that many of us experienced as we moved through and continue to move through the pathway through uncertainty. So there's much been written about how the world might change as a result of COVID-19. Will whole sectors of the workforce be made unemployed? Will we all now be working from home? These are just two of the huge questions that we'll be able to answer in the coming months or the answers will become apparent to us. But we, before we all become unfurloughed or move out of our crisis management teams and back into our functions, let's reflect on the lessons that we've learned throughout lockdown and see as we build a new future, what we can learn from our recent past. And it's more important than ever because in our survey, 
51% of respondents said their organization had little or no plans to learn from lockdown. So I hope this webinar will give you some material to share with your leaders that will encourage them not only to respond to the challenges of the next normal, but respond with an awareness and pride in how much you've learned and overcome so far. So we like our webinars to be a little bit interactive. So uh, we're going to, uh, well, Joe's going to ask you a question. We're going to move aside and let Joe take over and ask you a question, have some interaction here. We've got a very high tech way of moving from one presenter to the other. We tilt the computer. Love it. <laughs> so yes, our question, really simple. What is your lockdown learning? We're going to be sharing some lockdown learnings that we've gathered from the insights from the survey that we've been running and from our own experience. But we would absolutely love to hear from you. You can see that there's a chat box and my colleague Zach is on. And I'd be grateful, Zach, if you could send a quick note to the chat box just to let people know where it is um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with Zoom at this stage. Um, and we would love to hear from you. What are your lockdown learnings, your biggest lockdown learning? Yeah, so if you fill them in the chat there, because I mean, every organisation will have learnings and reflections based on, on their sector and their customer base. Um, but we've identified through speaking to colleagues and through speaking to clients, some golden threads of learning that we'll be sharing uh, through this webinar that are common to all of us. But if anyone has any burning lesson or something that's popped into their mind, it'd be great to see it in the chat. Don't be shy. Ah, oh, here, yeah, that's an interesting one. Stop making assumptions about what is and what is not possible. I love that. Yeah, I think, uh, and Mark's going to talk about this a little later, but the ability, when there's a burning platform for something, we can absolutely make things happen. And Zach has said, take time for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Without, we, when, when, you, when you're working from home and the lines between home life and work life mm -hmm. are completely blurred, you really have to intentionally make that time for yourself. Um, and Helen has said, being forced to slow down has improved my effectiveness, oddly enough. Yeah. Uh, oddly enough, that's an interesting little addition. But people there. are reporting yeah. much higher levels of productivity. So it's great. We're not rushing, as our Irish grandmother would say, 10 to the dozen. We're, we're thinking and being very conscious of what we need to achieve with the time that we have and all of the other pressures. And uh, Andrew said, um, and I, I know what you mean about this, so he said this is a confirmation more than a learning, and I know exactly what he's getting at there. So much can be completed remotely, really effectively if you use video tech as well. We get much more done in a week without mad hours. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, and Andrew, I think what you're saying about confirmation more than learning is that you kind of knew this instinctively, you just needed an opportunity to put it into action. And now that you've done it, you can see that it works. Um, the ability to work remotely and flexibly and still deliver, absolutely. Um, the argument for presenteeism no longer has an argument. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Uh, and that's from Christina. This has really pushed the narrative of flexible working and remote working. And they're talking about enshrining that in law. Um, so, you know, you're really on something there, Christina. Um, but we keep the humanity that has surfaced, says Angela. Absolutely. And, uh, and Andrew's got another learning. Um, feel much more connected with my peers as we use video far more than we did seeing faces rather than using phones as we used to. Interesting, yeah, because, uh, and, and I've got a colleague who works in a global business, and she was saying that the, the connectivity across the global business is just turbocharged in the last few months, because in ways that they had never expected, they're actually working together now in, in ways that they just didn't even, they didn't occur to them before. Um, and uh, Louisa has said, tech capability can be mastered by all. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually talking to someone from uh, from a, uh, a charity for older people yesterday and we were talking about how you can capture that small small percentage of older people and bring them online and we were talking about how we've been running events and fun people have made it work in ways they've never yeah. expected before lockdown um, and Bernard has commented um, I mentioned in Black Lives Matter one needs to improve diversity and be seen to improve diversity people joining it joining businesses today expect that and they want from the company they work for, they want that from the company they're looking for. Yeah, I think he's yeah, right there. absolutely. Right at the beginning of lockdown, we were worried about in terms of, you know, diversity is broad. It's, it's Black Lives Matter. It's about gender. It's about sexuality, how you identify. It's also about personality and preference and communication style. And very early on in the lockdown, we ran a session with Nadia Feiner, the psychologist. He talked about how you can include naturally shyer people in your webinar so they don't get hidden, their voice isn't heard, the silent 
majority out there, or the silent minority, she called it out there, aren't excluded. So that whole piece around diversity, I think, has definitely come to the forefront. And as we move into Renew, Bernard, you're right, it's too big an opportunity not to learn from the demonstrations and what we've heard from people online and on the news. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's Brilliant. great. So I'll, um, I'll start to share with you then the lessons that we heard from you, uh, your interviewees, and from our survey. So I'm just going to remove this. See if I can move that forward. Right, great. So the first area I want to talk about is about agile working. So as we move through return and into the final stage of the pandemic renew, most organizations that we've talked to and, and many organizations we're actually working with to help them work out their transition either into return or from return and into renew, they have some sort of transition plan. However, it is our firm belief and talking to people throughout the interview phase pulling this together, they believe too that return and renew will not be linear. Return and renew will not just be a plan. Um, and we like to consider it a bit like a muscle that will have to work to build our capacity to absorb uncertainty. During lockdown, we've all had to respond to constantly evolving situations and draw upon the innovative skill set to create new solutions to previously unknown and unpredictable challenges. So from furlough schemes to R numbers, from screens to one meter plus, we've had to make sense and respond to new information on an almost daily basis. And our survey revealed that leaders consider the ability to work agilely to be the number two most important skill that their people will need in order to successfully transition into and cope with the new and next normal. But if we accept that we've been working agilely and that's great and we want to take some of that agile working back into the workforce, what has been the catalyst for the agility that we've experienced over the last few months? And we believe the reason we've all been working so agilely is a very simple one. We just had to. We had absolutely no choice. So in other words, we were all focused on the same issue, how to move forward when no one has all of the answers. And, and that's lesson number one from lockdown, really. We've all been innovative and creative and agile because we've had a burning platform. We've all had a collective purpose that we're pointing towards. We couldn't make an excuse and just simply move it to quarter four. So lesson number one, innovation and agility happens when there is a burning platform. And we're going to hear from Josie here, who's going to talk a little bit around how the purpose in her organisation and that burning platform really guided her colleagues through lockdown and is helping them come out the other end successfully. But the things that really came out was that during a, during a pandemic, the purpose of our company had to kind of really been brought home to people. Um, and at Upcam, we've been involved in um, 30 plus COVID studies, our antibodies are being used. So suddenly you, you're talking a lot more about the impact and the difference that you're making as an organization. And therefore people were feeling really engaged and motivated. And I think it highlighted to us that we probably don't talk about it enough and we don't share those stories enough because we're all just kind of assuming that everyone involved understands the impact that we're having. So that was um, uh, a lesson that we, that we know we want to take forward as we start to go back to normal or whatever um, happens next. So we've all worked differently. And I'd like to talk a little bit now about different ways of work working. I read in Forbes magazine this week, or Forbes magazine, um, they informed us that uh, work is forever changed. Um, and certainly we've seen many changes in the way we've worked over the last few months. Um, many of our interviewees told us that working from home is likely to be replaced with more flexible working patterns. Um, and a new phrase we heard was working near home. 
But during the pandemic, we learned to function within matrix stru structures. Uh, SWAT teams were put together in the stabilized phase to really try and deal with the daily challenges that were coming up. We responded well to atypical ways of working, trying to accommodate the balancing of workload and home life. We worked alone, although I think it's fair to admit that we weren't really ever left alone by our partners or our pets or our children or even the postman or every time you started a webinar, Amazon. They seemed to <laughs> knock on the door as soon as we went live. Um, but over the course of lockdown, the fact that we, we've not been able to observe our teams at their desks has meant that leaders have had to trust their people to get the job done. And with no boss within easy reach, employees have demonstrated really high levels of creative problem solving, and many report an increase in productivity and innovation. We were all in this together, not in the sense of a political slogan, but as a reality. No one in any part of the world could fail to have been impacted by COVID-19. We were all focused on doing our best to keep moving forward and beat the virus wherever we were. And this is lesson number two from lockdown. Work can happen anywhere. With a shared and clear focus, coupled with empowerment, we will innovate our way around most problems wherever we are. And Zach's going to share a little bit now about how he managed work, working from home, and the things he did to make sure he kept productive and mentally well. Well, Joe, uh, it's quite a personal one for me because it's one I directly experienced. And the problem I found was I was sitting in this chair, the very chair that you see me in right now, for very extended period, periods of time. Um, and that's for a number of different reasons. But the lesson I got from it was I wasn't separating out my work time and my personal time. My home became my office more than my home. I live alone and it was just me, this chair, this computer, this screen. And that led to a number of different challenges around when I was working, the intensity with which I was working. And I think perhaps one of the, the lessons that we can all learn from it, particularly as leaders, is, is how we can do two things for our teams. And that's how we can encourage them to work around their own timetable if they're working from home but also the intensity with which they do work at periods of time. So for example, for me, I learned eventually to work with high intensity over short bursts and take more breaks. So I was getting out of this chair instead of sitting here for 12 or 14 hours a day. Great, thanks for sharing that, Zach. That was really personal, really human and authentic, really genuinely what happened and the challenges that you were dealing with. And I know we talked about a couple of those during our one-to-ones over the last few months. Um, and that kind of moves us into the third area I want to talk about. So for many of us, the major impact of COVID-19 was in fact that we were working from home. Our new ways of communicating gave us greater insight into our lives. Um, and we got to see who we are as people outside of the office, outside of our uniforms or outside of our desk. We've checked out each other's wallpaper, we've heard barking dogs, or, or we've had to reschedule a conference call because the kids needed feeling, feeding. And because of that, we've become so much more open about who we are. We've revealed so much more about ourselves and we've connected in with each other in ways that would almost seem impossible before lockdown. And this has to many extents, in terms of leaders and direct reports, started to strip away the hierarchy and status. I can't rely on my desk or my office or positional power to get stuff done. We're all on an equal playing field when we're attending a meeting from our kitchen table. We have had far more human connections over the last couple of months. One-to-ones, in many cases, have still continues to happen. But clients have told us they've recognised a real difference between a check-in and a check-up on a Zoom call. And that this recognition has led to far more connected, far more valuable and far more authentic conversations, even when we can't physically be together. Whilst we all talk about working from home, we must remember 
that the ability to work from home is a privilege and not available to everyone. Now, I read one person on Twitter saying, I'm not working from home, I'm at home during a crisis trying to work. And this leads us to lesson number three from lockdown. We've always had to manage the balance between work and home life. The pandemic has helped us and revealed so much about our whole selves and we can create deeper and more authentic conversations as a result of that. Now, leaders need to encourage and enable people to carry on being authentic and bring their whole selves to work. So focusing on leadership now, there was no rule book for COVID-19. And Angela's gonna talk a little bit around the conversations that she's had with us as a team and with her family and how she led through COVID-19? Um, I think um, not making assumptions about people, um, about where they're at and what they've understood. Um, so not assuming that people are okay or not okay, uh, not assuming that everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing. So even on a, a personal level, renegotiating with household members that know just because you empty the dishwasher doesn't mean you've done your share of housework. So stopping and let's right let's all renegotiate who's going to do what um and it's the same with uh, team members is they as might assume they're doing one thing but because you're not there touching base all the time they're not checking in with you about smaller things so um so it's always testing assumptions and you you don't realize you're making them sometimes so it's keeping the communication channels open with everybody great thanks a lot angela for sharing that um you know, we, whether we had to lead at home or whether we had to lead in continued work, there was no playbook for COVID-19. No one had all the answers. And leaders particularly had to manage constantly evolving data sets and make rapid decisions, knowing they might need to reassess, change the decision as new data sets or new information materialized. In our leading through white paper, Leading Through Uncertainty white paper, we shared the OODA loop, which was used by dogfighters in the First World War to make decisions as they went into aerial battle. And we suggested that a transparent loop of decision making would either enable a leader to take their people with them through constantly evolving situations. What you do as a leader when no one knows what to do, that was the big question. And this was the question that we had to answer during lockdown. So many of us took inspiration from the startup community um, and they practiced startup leadership, where we built our solution based on what we knew to be true from the OODA loop, tested it in the real world and led what worked and what didn't work and iterated according to that learning. So the need to constantly iterate and change course in public showed us that leadership is not all about having all of the answers. We learned what worked through failing fast. We developed solutions to hitherto unpredictable or unheard of challenges by crowdsourcing and asking for the wisdom of our people and our teams. We really learned what leadership is about. And this is lesson number four in lockdown. The leader's role is not to show and tell or to have all of the answers. The leader's role is to release the ideas and potential of their people. So I'm gonna ask Joe to come back now and join us as we, we ask you in terms of your understanding of uh, what do you think the role of the leader, how it will change as a result of COVID-19 so how will the role of the leader change in a post-COVID-19 world? And again, if you'd like to share in the chat function. Yeah. So that question again, how do you think the role of the leader will change in a post-COVID world? Mark has given one perspective there. Uh, we'd love to know if you think that's right and what other potential changes to the leader's role there might be in the future. And we say a post-COVID world, but of course it's kind of an ongoing... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see that in Germany, they've gone back into lockdown. Mm. 
in some of the areas there. And we know that it's not linear, we'll get waves of challenges, which is why we talk about yes. being the muscle. I actually, within that next normal, maybe, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people have talked about resilience being an essential skill we've had to hold. So for leaders and for individuals. Mm -hmm. So we've got some coming in. Um, so the leader should be more of an enabler setting the direction and providing the environment for people to flourish. That's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. lovely, um, great. And that actually connects with the innovation ecosystem, the book you wrote, pre-lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Which I will be assessing and we'll probably will be publishing a new version next year post-lockdown. Yeah. And building trust, uh, Angela says, building trust with them in the team and across the team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Louisa has said, more compassionate, more focus on uh, EQ and empathy and uh, understanding of EQ to be in tune with the future challenges as well as team mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And EQ is uh, emotional, emotional emotion intelligence. Yeah, yeah emotional intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, great, super, lovely. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to take and the screen more, back. More of a partner as well. That's another, um, that's another phrase that's just come up. So leaders, leaders as more of a partner to their teams and to their people. And... Uh, Understanding of mental health issues yeah. better for those working independently. Yeah, great. Actually, okay. that's really important. We talk a little bit around mental health and the impact of well-being and wellness just at the end of this webinar. Thanks so much for sharing everything there in terms of uh, what you believe the role of the leader will be going forward in a, in a post-COVID-19 world. The fact that we are on this webinar now, the fact that I'm having this conversation from my dining room to you, wherever you are, whether you've returned back to the office, or whether you're in your small home office or, or at your kitchen table, we have been through massive digital transformation. And recent reports suggest that 55% of all consumers are now likely to buy online. We've seen so much innovation in the digital space. Um, we've become much more proficient at Team, Zoom, Skype, WhatsApp, WeChat, wherever we are. Business, particularly retail, I think have responded very well to the challenge of lockdown through innovating with technology. Uh, we've witnessed the birth of virtual showrooms, um, online personal training sessions, and film distributors unable to release in cinemas have brought the latest films to download at leisure in our homes. Many of our clients told us that this push to transform digitally will continue and even intensify in business as usual. Alongside this, as firms seek to reduce costs further, there's likely to be an increase in pressure to accelerate automation. But what's interesting is that most of this new technology existed well before lockdown. We've been through digital transformation, yes, but actually it already existed. We just didn't want to use it. What stopped us? And this is lesson number five from lockdown. We may already possess the solution to our challenge, but we're reluctant or unable to see it. And particularly when we work on innovation projects with clients, we find so often the solution, the insight, the nugget, the kernel of the idea that will transform their challenge already exists in the organization. And for some reason, they're just unable to see it. So lesson number five, really asking ourselves, why might we be reluctant or unable to see a solution that already exists in our organization? We've already heard some discussion about it, but certainly well-being has risen in prominence over the last few years. But kind of, if I'm being really honest, it was seen still to some extent as a little bit fluffy, maybe just kind of one of those HR initiatives. In fact, last year in people management, there was a report on research that was carried out by Harvard Medical School. And it was about company wellbeing programs. And it concluded that these initiatives are unlikely to return significant results. So it's clear that a sun salutation is not going to fix a toxic business culture. However, during lockdown, our understanding and the importance that we place on well-being has absolutely deepened. We always knew that physical was part of well-being, and we've seen some great examples of this in lockdown with a, you know, things like Joe Wicks uh, in the morning. We've seen a huge increase in running with things like couch to 5K apps uh, and online sporting activities. And over the last few years, positively, 
but we've seen an increase in the public debate around mental health. And over lockdown, there's been a huge uptake in support apps like Calm.com, The Whispering Frenchman on YouTube, and initiatives such as Head Start. But our time in lockdown has reminded us all about the value of connectivity, a key part of well-being we might not have thought of before. And it's also highlighted our awareness of the challenges of isolation. Alongside this, we've become more comfortable with publicly expressing our need to invest in ourselves and, and take some time out for me. If you remember Angela's conversation was about negotiating what rules and what roles and what people were going to play so that everyone was being taken care of. Well-being is very much now at the forefront of public conversation. And as we now know that those with underlying health conditions or suffering from obesity are more likely to die as a result of COVID-19, the impetus for well-being is unlikely to go away. So as we return to our places of work, we will find an increased focus on safety and well-being. Social distancing will continue, temperature checks, sanitation stations, and flexible working will all become part of our work day. Alongside this, our societal consciousness around well-being has shifted up a gear, and our expectation in relation to our employer in this regard may well have changed also. Clients are telling us they're looking at well-being to be a central part of their employee value proposition, rather than leaving it where it traditionally sat, on the edges of the benefit package, along with discount vouchers for a yoga class. And this is lesson number six from lockdown. HRDs and their execs need to understand how to lead for a culture of well-being, recognizing a significant increase in the expectation and consciousness of employees around this topic. So, what happened during COVID-19 was we became much more aware of well-being and Helen's going to share some examples there of her experience. I think you're right. Um, our lives have always been different even before lockdown. I think it's just become clearer now since lockdown because we are having to check on well-being more and make sure that people are working okay and that, that they're feeling all right. I think flexibility is key and we, we, we all were able to you know, work from home quite quickly and adjust to that. Um, we've always had a flexible approach to working, so, so trust that people are going to get the job done. I think trust has been huge during lockdown because you, you don't physically see someone in the office and they're not doing the nine to five necessarily. And saying to people, we know that you're going to get the job done if you need to look after your kids during the course of the day and come back on later on in the evening to do some work, that's absolutely fine. We know that you'll get it done. So I think trust has been, has been quite important for us. Thank you, Helen, for sharing that. Trust. I think you're right. Um, our lives have all. So the personal and the professional absolutely collided during COVID-19. Um, and whilst conducting our research for this webinar and the follow-up white paper that you'll receive after today, many leaders also shared their personal learnings from lockdown. A couple I'm going to share with you now. One, we've learned to work from home, meaning that we've learned to move new seats, as Zach said, go out into the garden, start at 2 p.m., finish at 8 use remote technology, continue working with our colleagues, all whilst uh, loading the dishwasher. We've realized that it's okay to not be okay. We will have bad days, we will have good days, and we'll have nyeh days. And what we're also hearing is that we are reassessing what is important to us in life. How long are we prepared to commute for in the mornings? How much family time did we sacrifice before lockdown? And do we want to do that when we return? And why do we do what we do? I'm gonna hand back to Jaina, who's gonna ask you a question and again, ask for your participation in the chat. So yes, um, thinking about personal, on a personal note, thinking about the personal lessons that we've taken from lockdown. You shared at the beginning some of the business lessons you've taken, but we'd love to hear what are some of the 
personal lessons that you've taken from lockdown, the things that uh, you're going to take with you into your into your li broader lives going forward. Mark was just talking about well-being and thinking about the whole self. So, you know, what personal things are you taking out of lockdown? For me, one thing that I'm doing is um, I'm going to make sure that I continue to make time for learning piano. So during lockdown, I've been teaching myself piano and now I've got a teacher and I'm going to make sure that I make time for that. So I'm going to build a new habit in order to learn that skill and keep developing it because I've really enjoyed it and I've appreciated having a little bit of extra time to do it but now I realize that it's something that's important to me that I want to take forward. So what personal lessons are you taking out of lockdown? I remember saying at the beginning of lockdown, oh my nieces are English and Spanish and Spanish is the language spoken in their home. I speak it relatively well but I thought I'm going to have a great opportunity to learn to speak Spanish, Spanish fluently. Unfortunately, we've been so busy during lockdown, I haven't learned that foreign language, but I have started to run. I've started to take care of myself physically a lot more than I did in the past. And I'm committed to doing my three runs a week during lockdown. And I really want to carry on doing those. Not at five in the morning, because I've got a conference call at six. I want to make sure I put some time and make some time to look after myself physically. Because I think if I take care of myself, I can then take care of my team and my clients in a much better way. For me, one of the most interesting things that came out of the research that we did was uh, Angela's comment about um, having the negotiation conversations with her family members and how that's going to help her in her work context to have those kind of negotiation conversations mm -hmm. with members of the team. And Louisa has come through saying uh, that she's going to focus on maintaining balance, so continue to prioritise exercise, healthy eating, good sleep habits, quality family time as well as and as well as is in capitals as well as work yeah um and times in a personal commitment to screen free time every day mm. do you know i i think that's important absolutely and it's something that when you're when you're sort of moving between meetings and some some zoom calls and some time on your phone you don't notice it so much but when every meeting is on screens it becomes quite intense and, uh, and I think we've all learned that, um, you know, we can be productive in a virtual context, but it can also take it out to be if you're constantly looking at the screen. And research has come out, we were talking to the HRD from Public Health England a couple of weeks ago, research has come out to say that actually it's more exhausting having these meetings in one dimension because you're not able to pick up on all the micro expressions that you subconsciously see when you're physically face to face with someone. So your brain is actually having to work harder to understand how connected is this person, what clues and signals am I getting from them? And that's even more tiring. Lots of our colleagues and our clients talked about feeling much more tired. Now there's, there's ongoing anxiety, which in and of itself is tiring. But that having to work so much harder to really connect in with someone and understand are they getting what I'm saying means that by the end of the day, most of us are pretty exhausted. And, yeah, absolutely. And Helen has just, uh, just mentioned about another daily routine, having a daily bit of exercise, even just a walk at the end of the day can make a difference. And before you'd been too busy and made excuses, but you know, it's not that we're not busy, but we're at home. So we can actually easily go out and do that. And it's something to to find ways of keeping on doing, even when we're no longer working from home every day. Brilliant, so some great Thank personal you. lessons there. Oh, one more has oh. come through. Yeah, so Christina has said, uh, more balance with work and, and my time. Uh, when my lunchtime walk clashed with a meeting, I did a walking meeting Love that. previously. Yeah. And this is a good point. So previously I would have cancelled the walk, but now I found a way to prioritise the walk and do the meeting. And I wonder if there's a learning there about making sure those clashes don't happen in the future. Maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're not taking it that far, but there's a thought there. And uh, Andrew has said, uh, agree with the end of day walk, so much more refreshing than sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, Great. lovely. Thanks, Thank everyone. you so much for sharing those. Um, so as I said, the personal and the professional absolutely collided during COVID-19. Um, mostly, the majority of us got through on most days, even if we found it at times a little bit tough. But many of our interviewees shared that having a belief that they'll get through this to arrive at a better tomorrow whilst dealing with the brutality of today is what enabled them to get through. Knowing that there is life beyond this, that they are facing forward to something beyond what they're dealing with now. And we explored this, it's called the Stockdale Paradox, during our Leading Through Uncertain Times white paper. But if we do believe that there will be a tomorrow, the question that many of us are asking now is what is that tomorrow going to create? 
Our time in lockdown has given many of us the space to reflect upon what's important and what impact we want to have upon the world. And in this context, we've also started to reflect upon the sort of work that we do. Now, there's been much discussion, Simon Sinek included, about millennials and their desire to work for organisations that have a very clear sense of purpose. But I think that COVID-19 has seen the debate around purpose opened up into the mainstream. With new definitions of essential or key workers now part of the language, and with Vogue magazine putting a Waitrose sales assistant on the cover of the UK edition, the time has come for us all to consider what impact we could have on the world. Now, more than ever, as we move through these disrupted times, we need a North Star to help us overcome the unknown unknowns that we will need to confront as we move forward into Renew and out of lockdown. For the leader, the last lesson from lockdown is that to capitalize on all previous six lessons, you need to re-explore, share, and align your team behind your organization's purpose. And we'll be exploring that in a webinar in July which we'll invite you to, and more details are to follow. So I'm gonna hand back to Joe now, who'll finish the webinar, and thank you for listening to me this afternoon. Mark, thank you so much. Um, I know I got, I got a lot out of that, and I think people on the call did as well, so thank you so much for all the thought and energy you've put into that. And our clients, well, thanks to them, because they, they provided it to me. Absolutely, and uh, yes, exactly. So thanks to everyone who contributed to the survey, thanks to everyone who joined me on Zoom, for interviews, uh, which were very kind, which you very kindly let us share on the webinar today. We really, really appreciated all of the effort that people made to put this uh, research together for us. So thank you. The, uh, the webinar will be, uh, is being recorded and we'll be sharing it with you later. So you can rewatch it. Uh, you can share it with people in the organization if you need to. Uh, if you wish, if you think it would benefit them. We're also going to be publishing a white paper summarizing all of the research and summarizing the insights and the key lessons. So look out for that in your mailbox in the next couple of days. And um, the other thing that the research taught us and showed us was that actually in terms of the skills that leaders need, um, they, they, there's, there's a certain skills gap. As Mark said, 51% of organizations are not focusing on learning from lockdown, according to our research. So actually, you know, we need to, we need to focus on it because there are so many learnings that can be taken. And one thing that you can do is as you begin to return to the office, as you begin to return to work, you're going to be thinking about all of the practical pieces, but the other side of it is the cultural pieces. So we've developed an online training program called Leading Your Team to Return. It's, it's on demand. Um, you make one, 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 you access it as many times as you like. Everything's pre-recorded, ready there for you. There's templates, there's tools, and, and it covers these key skills around understanding self, understanding others, decision making, communication, prioritization, collaboration, coaching, team working, and leading remotely. All of these things are covered on the program in a series of videos with Zach Curtis, our capability director, and Mock, and I think I have pop up a couple of times as well. Um, so if you like our faces, you should join. If you like what we say, you should join. There's absolutely no reason not to join. And to make that even easier for you, we are providing you with a 50% discount code. So make a note of that. Welcome return 50 is the discount code and that'll give you 50% off the price of the course. So instead of it being 99 pounds, it'll be 49 pounds 50. I know at least one person on this pro on, on the webinar today has already completed Yay. the course. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's good, it's worth completing. And we put a QR code on the screen. So if you take your smartphone, I usually demonstrate this, but my smartphone is currently live streaming to Facebook. I've got um, it. Thanks, Mark. So you take, your, uh, you take your smartphone, scan the QR code, and it'll immediately open up the page that you need to get to in order to register for the course. It'll be great to see you on there. If anyone has any questions about it, you can email me on joe at innovationbeehive.com. I emailed you this morning, so you've got my email address. Any concerns or questions, do reach out. Um, but it will be absolutely wonderful to see you on that course, hear what you think of it. And, uh, you know, there's people who've done it already who will be able to tell you that it's worth doing. So, Mark, thank you again. And thank you to everyone who contributed to the research. It's been a pleasure. And, and also to you for taking part in the webinar today and for your contributions on, on here. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Mark, and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Take care.